Uh, I'm Tom Schmelk. I'm one of the forest entomologists <laughs> with the Maine Forest Service. Um, and among, <laughs> among other things, I am the program lead on brown tail moth. Um, so typically I give this presentation to the towns. It usually lasts 45, 50 minutes. I'm going to try to cut it down a little bit. Um, but usually when I cut a lot out of this presentation, there's always questions on, on basically the slides that I cut out. Um, but let's get this started. Okay, so brown tail moth is a non-native moth. It's originally native to Europe. Um, it was introduced, so the story that I always hear is that it was introduced into Somerville, Massachusetts in 1897 on rose bushes uh, into a florist shop. And that florist shop happened to be next to a railroad depot. Um, as you'll see a little bit later in this presentation, um, brown tail moth is very good at hitchhiking um, and, and that little element sort of helped it um, spread uh, throughout New England. Um, it's also related to uh, gypsy moth, um, and that'll come into play a little bit later. Uh, so this is the sort of the general area where brown tail moth is native to in Europe. Um, as you can see, it stretches down to North Africa um, and into Eastern Europe. Um, but I would, I would say definitely the stronghold is in Western Europe here. So this is important because it's coming from uh, lat basically the same latitudes uh, that we are here in Maine. So areas typically at the same latitude have the same climate, have the same weather. Uh, so it's, it's pretty adapted to our coldest winters and our warmest summers. It's not a very picky eater. Uh, typically in Maine, we find it uh, most commonly in oak birch, cherry, elm, poplar, and basically any, uh, any fruit tree or, or ornamental crab apple. Um, but also on the host list are things like maple, uh, but we rarely see it in maple. It's only usually when the oaks are so heavily, uh, so heavily occupied that we see some spillover into maple. Uh, this is just sort of a, a diagram on how to how to tell the different hairy caterpillars in Maine um, from brown tail. Uh, I'll just tell you the two most distinguishing features. So with brown tail, you have these two hunter orange dots towards the tail end, and then each body segment has sort of a white margin on each side. Um, so these two in the middle, eastern tent and forest tent, those are both native. Um, eastern tent is usually you usually see that on roadsides in the same, um, in some of the same hosts as uh, brown tail, but it's uh, sort of at a different time of the year and it's a, a different shape to the nest, uh, but I'll go over the nests in a little bit. Um, and then you have uh, gypsy moth. It, it tends to occur a little bit later um, in the summer than brown tail. And typically after, after July or after late June, we often get a lot of calls uh, saying, you know, I, I have gypsy moth. I got a lot of calls from Western Maine in Freiburg um, saying that they, they had brown tail out there. And at first I was a little bit alarmed and then I had to check myself. And, you know, it was a little bit late for brown tail caterpillars. And sure enough, through some of those photos, um, it was a, a gypsy moth outbreak, um, but just something to be aware of. So I used to say that brown tail is the only caterpillar in Maine that has those two orange dots, um, but there is one other. Uh, you can see this. So this is white marked tussock moth and it does have these two orange dots here, um, but it looks quite different than brown tail. It sort of looks like uh, Dr. Seuss's toothbrush. Okay, so a little bit about the history of brown tail in Maine. So they overwinter in these palm sized webs. Um, you know, no bigger than the size of the palm of your hand. So this photo here is uh, the result of some of the community-wide uh, clipping efforts that were, that occurred in the early 1900s. Um, so if you could imagine how many webs are in this one pile, um, it's, it's quite a lot. Um, also, all these burlap sacks on the back of this truck are, are stuffed with those clipped brown tail moth webs. Uh, so when brown, so brown, uh, so brown tail has been in Maine since 1904. Um, so well over 100 years. It's it's not really a new problem. This just happens to be the um, the latest and greatest outbreak. 
Um, so extensive control efforts were made in the 1900s, uh, as evidenced by those photos. Winter webs were clipped and burned by the tens of thousands, and there's large spray projects initiated. Um, these are some of the um, chemicals that they were spraying around the turn of the century, around uh, 1911. Um, they include stuff like Bordeaux lead, bug death, um, arsenate of lead. So one of the reasons why Maine has higher incidence of bladder cancer in some towns um, is because of this chemical here, arsenate of lead, and that was used um, sort of as a kill-all, you know, even before DDT was, uh, was on the scene. Uh, a lot of people cut their apple trees down. Um, if they had an orchard that was not active, they would just cut their apple trees down um, to sort of save themselves uh, from, from the brown tail. Uh, so this photo up here is a, uh, uh, they're at a farm school. In addition to doing your uh, every other year pruning of the apple trees, they were also teaching the students how to prune out uh, brown tail, brown tail moth webs. Uh, so this spot down here is Somerville, Massachusetts. That's the um, initial introduction point. And then uh, basically, so this, light gray area here, that's the maximum extent in 1914. So you can see uh, it's in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, almost all of Maine. The reason why it's not really here is because of a lack of hosts, it's mostly conifers here. Um, but basically um, all of New Hampshire, half of Vermont, uh, two thirds of Massachusetts, half of Connecticut, all of Rhode Island, and even a little bit down here on, um, on Long Island in New York. So, uh, I'll, I'll go into this in a couple of slides, but there was a population collapse in the late teens, early 20s, and that's what this darker area illustrates, it sort of collapsed inward and, and sort of kept collapsing. Um, so the, the main takeaway point here is it only took 17 years for it to go from initial introduction to basically take, conquering all of New England and, and parts of Southern Maine, uh, and that was through hitchhiking. Um, I was reading a, a old newspaper article from New Hampshire, and they it, this was in the, the 19-teens, and they implicated um, electric vehicles with basically helping to spread some brown tail around. And yes, I did say electric vehicles. That was sort of before petroleum became um, the major uh, energy source for vehicles. Um, so at this time that they're spraying and, and doing all these control programs, uh, there was a biological uh, control program that was instituted. There was a lot of uh, parasitic flies and wasps that were released. Um, so back in the day, uh, to get some of these biocontrol agents, they would basically go over to Europe um, and whatever was attacking that target species, they would bring it back and release it here. Um, they didn't really vet them to see if they attack some of our native species um, or if they were very specific to the target. And now there's a, sort of a decade long vetting process with the USDA in order uh, to approve some of these biocontrol agents, but that was not the case back in the day. Um, so the reason why I mentioned that brown tail is closely related to gypsy moth is that, um, so in 1869, gypsy moth was uh, brought over to the US intentionally uh, by a Frenchman that wanted to create an American silk industry, and those caterpillars escaped his cultivation and started started wreaking havoc. And gypsy moth is is the worst forest pest that we have, um, or or very near the top. Uh, so back in the 1870s, when gypsy moth was uh, you know becoming a big problem, they released a, a set of these flies and wasps for uh, gypsy moth. And then fast forward to the turn of the century when brown tail gets on the scene. Um, and a lot of the, there was another batch that was released just for brown tail, but a lot of the ones that were released for gypsy moth were generalists and they made the jump over to brown tail as well, um, and sort of gave some control. Uh, and this is, uh, so this is from the thesis of Carla Boyd, who is a, a grad student. She just graduated a couple of years ago. She did a lot of work on, um, on some of the parasitoid wasps and flies that are found uh, associated with brown tail. Um, and this is just some of her findings. Okay, so the uh, collapse that I mentioned happened in the late teens, early 20s. Um, they, we don't know specifically why that happened, but it was probably due to a combination of uh, cool, wet weather in the spring 
um, which helped the fungus that attacks brown tail, as well as the virus that attacks brown tail to sort of um, uh, gain hold and really, you know, really give some, uh, some population control and, and sort of crash the population. Um, so those flies and wasps, they do help control brown tail, but uh, definitely the fungus and the virus pack the most punch um, and have the most potency for controlling the population. Um, so again, here's that uh, 1897 uh, introductory point. And then in the late teens, uh, by 19, 1914, it was at its maximum extent. And then it sort of collapsed in the early 20s. And it basically kept collapsing until brown tail was um, basically just in coastal Maine and a couple of spots on Cape Cod. Um, that's sort of where it's hung out for, um, for the past 60, 70 years. Um, with with periodic outbreaks. Uh, so these sort of points here, um, in the 70s, uh, the main bulk of the population or the, the most notable parts of the population were on the Casco, uh, on the Casco Bay Islands. A lot of people asked me, you know, if it was just there, why didn't you go through and eradicate it? Um, so ju basically just saying that it was on those islands is sort of a false statement. It was definitely still on the mainland um, in low populations, this, um, but those islands had the highest populations. So um, just a little confusion there. Okay, so the reason why I'm here uh, is that the primary problem with brown tail moth is that it's a human health risk. Um, I'm sure those of you who have had the rash uh, do not need me to explain this part. Um, it is very itchy, very uncomfortable. Uh, so the reason why it is very itchy and uncomfortable is that the caterpillars are covered in these uh, small toxic hairs and these, to these hairs are, are barbed. So you're not only getting a mechanical irritation, um, but they're also filled with, they're hollow and filled with toxins. So you're getting a mechanical and a chemical irritation. Um, so they, they, the caterpillars sort of shed them. Uh, they break off the caterpillars readily but then also when the caterpillars are, are um, shedding their skin to grow a little bit bigger, uh, they also shed that skin with all those toxic associated hairs. Um, so they can settle on leaves, um, in you know unused parts of your yard, like under decks, boat trailers, uh, stuff like that. And they can become airborne again. Um, although typically if they are out in the yard or out in the woods, um, precipitation like uh, rain and snow does help incorporate them into the soil and, and they become a non-issue. Um, but it's it's kind of dangerous in those places that I mentioned that are uh, sort of dry and, and sheltered from precipitation. Um, and again, this toxin uh, lasting one to three years in the environment is typically more in those dry sheltered areas. It's not really uh, out in the woods or, or in a place that gets a lot of rain. Uh, rash can last hours to weeks. Uh, it's even months in some individuals, although I have a feeling that is um, people coming into contact with more hairs. Um, most common in June and July, that's when the caterpillars are out and active and um, the most hairs are present. Um, and most treatments are real focused on relieving symptoms. So the secondary problem is that brown tail is um, a minor forest pest. Uh, and it typically alone does not cause uh, mortality in trees. Um, trees are very tolerant of foliation, particularly oaks. Um, they can survive multiple years of defoliation and be just fine. Um, two of the things that compound that in Maine are other pest species, so gypsy moth or winter moth also attacking the trees at the same time. Um, and also the drought that we've had in, the, in, the, in Maine for the past few years um, has sort of stressed the trees out a little bit more. Okay, so identifying some of these webs, um, there's a few different web making caterpillars in Maine. Um, so the first one is fall webworm, which is native. Um, it creates a very large web, um, sometimes in, in some of the same hosts that um, brown tail is. So uh, cherry and, and apple and other fruit trees, um, but also in walnut, which, which you'll never see brown tail in walnut. Um, also, it's a very large web. Um, as you can see, that's my hand. It's about the size of a football, if not larger. Um, and also sort of, uh, these webs are sort of um, 
basically beginning in in late summer. Uh, but the most the biggest difference is that size. Uh, then you have eastern tent caterpillar, which I mentioned before. Um, again, another native caterpillar. A lot of people think that they're invasive, um, and they don't really cause that much harm to a tree. They might strip the leaves off a branch or two, but um, they're native, so they have all their their native predators uh, and checks and balances. Uh, so no need to really worry about them. Um, these webs are more occurring uh, in the spring and early summer, and um, brown tail webs are, are not going to be around that time of year. Um, and then they're also a, a very large nest, again, about the size of a football. Um, and if you notice, uh, it's also in a different place than brown tail. It's basically where the branches meet the trunk here, um, and you'll, you'll never see brown tail in that location. Um, so we do have a couple of silk moths, and these are probably, I would say, the hardest for um, public to tell the difference between uh, our native silk moth uh, pupil cocoons and brown tail, um, as they can be sort of around the same size, about the size of the palm of your hand. Um, but typically, uh, it's more of a kind of like a bag that looks like it has sort of brown hairs on it. And the silk that these are composed of um, doesn't really stay bright white. Uh, quite like brown tail does. Um, and if you think about it, um, it's basically just one large bag with a single individual moth inside of it. Um, and it, it's a pupa, and, uh, come spring, the, the adult moth will emerge. Um, brown tail is gonna be composed of usually multiple leaves. Um, it's gonna be sort of a, a quote unquote messier web uh, that's sort of intertwined. It's not gonna be a single bag. Okay, and now to brown tail, um, the nests are quite variable, but there's always a few um, few things that they have in common. Uh, like I mentioned before, they're, they're never gonna be bigger than the size of the palm of your hand, um, and they will be comprised of a fresh, bright white silk, um, particularly where uh, the leaf uh, meets the branch here, and they're almost always gonna be on the very tips of the branch. Um, so these are more examples. Uh, sometimes it can be a single leaf that's uh, silk together, but more typically it will be something like this that's uh, sort of 50-50 leaf and silk material. Uh, so this will we'll move into the life cycle. Um, so they spend the, the very small caterpillars that are about the size of a sprinkle. Um, they will spend the, the winter in this web and reemerge in mid-April when it becomes warm and when the leaves start bursting. Uh, so in, inside every one of these palm-sized webs, there's between 25 and 400 caterpillars. Um, so even if you're only able to clip out a few, um, you'll be doing yourself a world of good. This is a very common sight in, in most of Maine, um, is these very tall oak trees with, with the brown tail moth webs at the top. Uh, so one of the things that you can do in your own dooryard or throughout town um, is if you go out on a nice bright sunny day, um, about this time of the year, once the leaves are off the trees and you stand with the sun to your back and look up at the tops of the trees, you'll be able to see where these webs are and you'll be able to differentiate them between them and uh, mm -hmm. leaves that are still on the trees. They'll sort of shine this bright, fresh white color. Um, it's even probably more apparent than in these photos. And when I first heard about this technique, when I first came on the job, um, I had my doubts, but it, it really does work. Um, if you use that, those sunny days. Uh, so this is one, one of those palm size webs that I brought into the lab um, a couple of years ago, just to, to illustrate how many caterpillars are in each one of these webs. You can see it's not a very big, big web, but all these little uh, brown squiggles are those brown tail moth caterpillars. Um, so every, every web that you are able to clip out, clip it out for sure. Okay, so fast forward through the winter uh, to mid-April when it's sort of becoming around 50 degrees pretty reliably and the, the leaves, the buds are starting to break. Um, that's when the caterpillars emerge from their winter web. It's sort of, uh, they'll bask on the outside of the winter web to warm up and then they will start um, feeding. And these dark spots here on these buds are where the caterpillars have gone in and sort of mined out the buds and sort of uh, started eating the leaves before they've really, uh, really expanded. Um, so from basically mid-April um, until the end of June, these caterpillars will be out feeding 
And as they're feeding, they're growing larger, they're shedding their skin, um, and they're, you know, there's more of those toxic hairs around. Um, so probably one of the more uh, unpleasant times uh, in, in the brown tail moth life cycle. So in that late June, early July time period, they're going to be fully grown. They'll be you know, about the size of your pinky. Um, and they're going to be looking for a place to pupate. Uh, typically, it's basically any sheltered area. So under the eaves of your house, uh, vehicles that haven't moved in a while, car, uh, boat trailers, RVs, stuff like that. But then also right on the host, um, right on the host foliage. So these are sort of messy cocoons, um, and there can be multiple individuals inside each of these cocoons. Um, and one thing of note: uh, those the silk that comprises those cocoons are um, are impregnated with those toxic hairs from that last caterpillar skin, um, and it's sort of a defense against predators because uh, it's at a very vulnerable time in their lives. And then uh, a couple of weeks later after pupation, that's when the adult moths come out. Um, this is why they're called brown tail moth is because they have this brown abdomen. Again, uh, this is, so the adults don't have those toxic hairs that the caterpillars have. Um, it's, we, I get a lot of calls about it, um, but we've sort of, um, we've done research and, and uh, basically jumped, double checked and, and these uh, adult moths are, are not the ones that have the, the toxic hairs, just the caterpillars. Um, so the adults are attracted to light. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of a, it's the ratio for, of males to females that come to light. It's more heavily weighted to the males. The females um, don't really come directly to the light. They'll sort of hang out on the host foliage outside of the reach of the light. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we recommend that people keep their lights off um, in June and the first half of August or in July and the first half of August in order to prevent uh, more moths from, from uh, being attracted to your dooryard. Okay, so once the moths mate in July, uh, the females will lay her eggs, they'll, they'll lay their eggs on uh, the host foliage and each female can lay between 200 and 400 eggs in, in this egg mass. Um, and the female will cover them with hairs from her abdomen. Again, not the toxic hairs you have to worry about. Um, as you can see, this is in August uh, when these eggs hatch, you can see these little tiny caterpillars sort of hatching out and crawling away um, from that egg mass. Um, so this is, basically, this is basically happening in August and September and the very small caterpillars will feed communally and they will graze on the outer surface of leaf and it's a, a type of damage called skeletonization. Um, and at the same time that they're feeding communally, they'll also start communally uh, building that winter web that they will um, spend all winter in. Uh, so it's sort of a, a group effort, um, but they'll feed basically through August um, and through the end of September and possibly uh, some years into October. This is sort of just a, a summary of uh, the life cycle. Um, it's available online on our website, um, but the takeaway is uh, basically mid-April through the end of July is the worst time for the hares. Okay, so this is the current situation in Maine. Um, as it's no surprise to many of you, Brown's Home Office continue to expand its range. Um, and the most heavily impacted counties are Androscoggin, and Kennebec, Knox, and Waldo. Um, at the Maine Forest Service, the call volume was very, very high this year, um, well over 500 calls in addition to um, the other calls filled by other agencies. Uh, so these, this five to 600 calls was just from um, May through mid-August. Uh, and there was times where, you know, there was 25, 30 calls a day. I would be on the phone with somebody and there would be two other people that would call and leave messages as I'm um, uh, trying to, to talk to um, each homeowner. So quite, quite a bit of call volume. Uh, so we do, um, I'll, I'll talk about this now, I guess. Uh, so we do two different types of air, uh, two different types of survey. Um, one is two rounds of aerial survey. We fly one round in uh, late spring, early summer, 
to pick up the actual defoliation from the mature caterpillars that are consuming the leaves. And then we do another round of aerial survey in um, late summer, early fall to pick up that skeletonization damage from those really tiny caterpillars. Um, so both of those uh, rounds of flights, we basically we mapped 198,000, almost 200,000 acres of damage. Um, and to put that into perspective for you, so last year it was about 156,000 acres of defoliation. And prior in the very early 2000s, so this current outbreak that we're in started in 2015 uh, is when we first started seeing elevated numbers. Um, but in the early 2000s, there were uh, at a, a max like 10,000 acres of defoliation. So this is quite, quite a bit more. Um, so this is some of the, the photos that we see from the air. This is out in, around Camden, and you can see this lighter brown patch here. Um, that's, that, those are oak stands that were basically completely defoliated. Um, this whole area was sort of um, inundated. There's a lot of areas in, in Maine that we're seeing this. Uh, so some silver lining. Um, so we have monitoring sites throughout Maine. Uh, we did about 10 monitoring sites that we'd go back to weekly and sort of um, monitor development and disseminate that information to the public to sort of guide management. Um, at some of these monitoring sites, we did see uh, some pathogen activity. So um, the fungus that attacks brown tail as well as the virus. Um, but we would only see it in like say one apple tree and you drive down the road and, and the other populations were healthy as can be. Um, one of the good things though, is that um, it is very widespread. So we, we've we seen the fungus and the virus basically throughout the range of brown, brown tail in Maine, um, which is great because that tells us that if we do get a more normal spring where it is wet in May and June, um, we're likely to see a large scale population collapse. Um, but I've been praying for a normal spring for the past couple of years, and I have not gotten what I wished for, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, like I said, here, uh, we do need that wet weather um, uh, in May and June in order for those collapses to happen. Um, and now it's at sort of at the scale where we might need two, two years in a row of that. But when the fungus and the virus do get going, um, they're pretty devastating to the population, which is great. Uh, so this, this is on the side of my house in Dresden. Um, this cat, a lot of this pathogen activity happened sort of late in the season. So this is late June when they're already starting to pupate. Um, this caterpillar that's hanging here in, in the U shape um, has a, is infected with the virus. Uh, so also something unexpected that we, I was very surprised to see is in September um, when I was monitoring some of these uh, webs in the making, we did see some pathogen activity um, and I'm not quite sure um, what causes small caterpillars to die, um, but they sort of melted into their, um, their winter web here. And it was sort of widespread, at least in Augusta, um, I didn't really see it too many other places. Um, and then also when I was monitoring some of these nests, um, there was, uh, some parasito parasitoid fly activity. Um, this is one of these uh, flies in the family to Canada um, that, are, that are exclusively parasitoid or exclusively parasitic. Um, so that was good news. Um, so last winter we did have two new detections. Um, this area that's circled in the red is the main bulk of the population of, of Brown Hill in Maine. Um, but we did find it in two locations up in Aroostook County. Um, these were single webs. And again, it speaks volumes to how well it can hitchhike, um, as you can see how far they're removed um, from the main bulk. Okay, so now getting into management. Um, I cannot stress this enough that the first step in management is always education. Um, so, we're designating February as Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month. Um, it's going through the governor's office now to make it official, um, but we're trying to sort of raise awareness. A lot of people that called me this spring and summer were completely unaware um, that they had brown tail until they were, um, they had the caterpillars and they were itching. And a lot of people started off the conversation by saying um, my fruit tree or my crab apple in my front yard. Um, and those are, those are the most easily clipped um, 
trees. So just trying to get, get more information out there um, would be useful. Uh, so some of the ways that communities can get involved um, through community education, uh, just like uh, this inf information mm -hmm. going on now. Sorry, somebody's not muted. Um, so celebration, uh, celebrations like web clipping events, um, neighborhood contests, etc. cetera. Um, basically just trying to, to get out there and, and disseminate the information, um, as much information as you can. Um, the reason why we picked February, um, is February in the winter in general is a great time from, for clipping webs, They're very easily visible hair activities next to none. There's no non-target effects when you're clipping out these webs. Um, you're just getting the caterpillars and um, nothing else really. Um, and all these clipping events and um, clipping activities are best done before mid-April uh, when the caterpillars become um, active again. Uh, and there's some other uh, other actions. I was talking to Aaron and he said that he, uh, he has links to our main forest service uh, Bronto resources, which is great. Um, social media reminders, if, if the town has a social media presence, um, signage and, and heavily infested uh, parks or, or other activity areas. Um, and then also 211 uh, is a great resource. So we just, uh, two weeks ago, we did a major revision to the Frequently Asked Questions website. Um, a lot of good information on there. We just added a lot of, um, a lot of questions that we were getting this past season, especially on uh, injections injections. Um, so these photos here are from Deer Isle and Deer Isle has a, a very great community presence. Um, they have multiple uh, multiple web clipping events each uh, each winter um, and it's a it's a really great way to get the community involved if you do have a lot of ornamentals or um, low shrubby vegetation that can easily be clipped. Um, it's a, a great time great great way to get involved. Um, so I mentioned those two, uh, those two types of survey. The other type of survey that we do is an annual winter web survey. Um, typically that starts in January of each year. So uh, this, um, this winter's winter web survey has not started yet. Um, but in those surveys, we basically drive throughout the infested area in Maine um, and we drop points. Uh, and those points have data on uh, estimated number of webs per tree per given stretch of road. Um, the host data um, and then also um, how prevalent uh, how prevalent it is. So uh, each one of these little dots here is uh, one of these dots that we we dropped um, during the survey. So the hotter the color, the more webs per tree there are. Um, and it's not a perfect survey. We don't cover every single road, um, but it is a good way to uh, and fairly accurate at predicting what it's going to be like next year. Uh, so just some tips here. Um, obviously, uh, you're going to want to, when you're moving into these infested areas, uh, May through July, um, remember Brantel is very good at hitchhiking. Um, so just uh, be careful about parking under host trees. Like, I know a lot of these shopping centers have um, have crab apples or, or ornamental trees um, that are host for Brantel. So just be cautious. Um, so during that winter web survey, uh, we did, <laughs> this is a photo that was taken a few years ago and in the circled area, there's uh, four or five winter webs there. Um, and this is a, in an area that's very far removed from the main bulk of the population. And the way that these got here, um, it's, it was this camper here. So what likely happened was that these people um, went, to the, went to enjoy the coast um, during that period when the caterpillars are active and unknowingly brought caterpillars back with them and, and sort of started a satellite in, infestation. Um, like I said, 17 years to basically conquer New England and parts of Southern Canada, um, very good hitchhikers. Um, so the main takeaway from this slide here is uh, if you are in an infested area, and this is something people always forget, including myself, um, is you're gonna wanna dry laundry in, um, inside if you're in a heavily infested area. Um, those hairs become airborne and, um, you know, you don't want them blown into your, your bed sheets or your towels. 
Um, and the, this is basically just another, uh, just take caution when you're doing yard work, um, try to work on days uh, after it's rain or wet the area down with a hose, um, especially in those areas that are sort of sheltered, like under a deck, boat trailer, uh, stuff like that. Um, and it's just some PPE uh, for dealing, uh, if, you, if you know you, you are dealing with a heavily infested area and you need to do the yard work anyway, um, just try to take every precaution that you can. Um, like I said, uh, wet down the area with a, HEPA, or, uh, with a hose um, if you are concerned about those hairs. Um, one thing that is very helpful, a lot of people call me in, in late May when the caterpillars are starting to move around. Um, and they're crawling all over the house and they're asking um, how they can deal with those caterpillars. Um, one of the things you can do, see if you have a wet dry vac um, with a good HEPA filter on it, put a couple inches of soapy water in the bottom of that. And then um, you, are, you can basically suck up the caterpillars and that, um, that soapy water will do two things. It will one, kill the caterpillars, but also prevent the hairs from becoming airborne again. Okay, so like I mentioned at the beginning, cold winter temperatures do not kill brown tail. It's coming from the lane, same latitude that we are here in Maine, um, but cool, wet springs do, particularly in May and June, and those are the uh, environmental conditions that help uh, that fungus and the virus really spread and proliferate. Uh, again, some notes on pruning. Um, the preferred method, if you can reach them, I know it's not feasible, um, either logistically or financially uh, to clip the webs out of some of these taller oak trees. But if you have lower ornamental or fruit trees, definitely clip them out. Um, so there's a couple ways you can destroy them. Um, once you've clipped them out is you can either burn them or soak them in a, a bucket of soapy water overnight. Um, and either of those are, are a, a great way to um, destroy the web. If you clip the webs out, and leave them on the ground, the caterpillars will just uh, climb up on the tree uh, come spring and it'll be like you hadn't done anything. Um, and again, you'll wanna do this before mid-April. That's when the caterpillars start coming out. So you have plenty of time this winter. Um, so chemical control, uh, you'll wanna do this before the end of May. Um, that's when the caterpillars are really large. And so most of these, Chemical treatments are focused on mitigating people coming into contact with these hairs. Um, so if, even if you were to spray later and kill a lot of caterpillars past at the end of May, you wouldn't really be doing um, any, any good from the standpoint of the hairs because you would have a lot of these large uh, caterpillar bodies with the associated hairs and it, it wouldn't really do, um, it wouldn't really um, do too, too good. Uh, so Aaron and I were talking before, and um, there have been a few towns that have done these town-wide spraying programs. Um, I would suggest getting into contact with Bill Shane from Cumberland. Um, from what I've heard from Bill uh, is that these town-wide spray programs don't really, they're only able to spray basically in right-of-ways along streets um, at municipal buildings, and they're not they're not really that effective. Um, they make people feel really good seeing the town out there doing something, spraying. Um, but from a, a standpoint of the entire population, um, it's really not that effective. Um, okay, let me, okay. So this is the last, uh, the last slide. I never used to have this in here, but basically uh, half the calls for the past two years have been uh, basically just on tree injections. Um, so the most commonly used active ingredient for tree injections is called acephate. Um, it's sort of a, a general insecticide. Um, and when you're doing these tree injections, it's sort of a, a timing to coincide with the tree moving water. So typically around bud burst. Um, and you're also trying to get the caterpillars when they're small enough to, to mitigate the, the hairs. Um, so a lot of people, you know, I, I've mentioned clipping out uh, webs in low trees. A lot of people have these large mature oak trees and we recommend uh, basically just treating the trees in high traffic areas or that are overhanging your house or your deck. Um, and don't worry too much about the trees that are further away from the house or, or in the woodlot. 
Um, like I mentioned before, a lot of these trees are very tolerant to defoliation, especially oaks. Um, so these tree injections can be done by a homeowner, but um, it's highly recommended to follow the instructions word for word. There is some user error, um, but they can also be done by a licensed pesticide applicator. Um, and the board pesticide control has a, uh, a lot of good resource, resources on um, active ingredients, which are registered in Maine um, and which are not um, among other uh, rules and regulations.